So in the last few videos, we've described a basic out-of-order design and I've talked about what happens in each one of these different stages. Okay, so in this, in this set of videos, I'm going to discuss a few more design details and I'll also integrate a load store queue into this design. Okay, so first up, I just wanted to talk about, you know, what leads to stalls in every single stage. Okay, so when does my instruction fetch stage get stalled? Okay, so the outputs of an instruction fetch stage get placed in my instruction fetch queue. Okay, and this might have, let's say, 16 entries. Once I consume all of those 16 entries, my instruction fetch stage has to stall because there's nowhere to put my outputs. Okay, then instructions from the instruction fetch queue move into the decode stage. So when does the decode stage end up stalling? When does it say that I'm not ready to receive any more inputs? That happens when the destinations of the decode stage uh, end up getting full. Okay, so once an instruction goes to the decode stage, it gets placed in the reorder buffer and the issue queue. So once those two structures fill up, your decode stage is going to be stalled because there's nowhere to put the outputs of the decode stage. Okay, every instruction that gets placed in the reorder buffer also takes uh, a register from the free pool of registers, right? So, you know, un unless you're a branch or a store instruction, right? But most other instructions, uh, before they get placed in the reorder buffer, also need a destination register. Okay, so um, your decode stage stalls if the ROB or the issue queue are full, or if register free pool is empty. Okay, so usually you end up sizing each of these structures so that no one of them ends up being like a do dominant bottleneck. Okay, so if I have 32 architected registers and 64 physical registers, it means I have x 32 extra rename register names. Okay, which means I should correspondingly size my reorder buffer to have about 40 entries. Okay, because this means that I can bring in 40 instructions, out of which, you know, 32 of them may need a register destination and eight of them might be branches or stores that don't really need a destination register. So then if I size my reorder buffer as being 40 entries, my issue queue will have a size of roughly 20. Okay, because the contents of the issue queue are a subset of what is sitting in the reorder buffer. Because once an instruction issues and leaves the issue queue, there's no point keeping that entry around in the issue queue. Okay, so it basically takes itself out of the issue queue. So the reorder buffer represents everything in the pipeline which includes instructions that are waiting for input operands in the issue queue. It also inclu includes instructions that are currently uh, doing their number crunching in the ALU stage. Or it also includes instructions that have completed and that are just sitting in the reorder buffer waiting for earlier instructions to commit. Okay, so the reorder buffer basically includes everybody, whereas the issue queue only includes a small subset the instructions that don't have at least one input operand and they're hence waiting in the issue queue for this operand to be made available. Okay, so the issue queue does not have to be as large as the reorder buffer. Okay, so then, you know, there are stalls in the issue queue like we've already discussed, you know, an instruction uh, gets to leave the issue queue only when its operands are available. Okay, so if everything that is currently executing is a long latency instruction, then there will be stalls in the issue queue because, you know, th there'll be several cycles uh, until somebody gets woken up and somebody gets gets to leave the issue queue. Then there are stalls in the reorder buffer when, uh, when, when the oldest instruction has not yet finished. Okay, so in every single commit stage you look at the reorder buffer and if the oldest instructions have finished they get to commit. But if the oldest instruction is some long latency operation uh, let's say some access from memory that's going to take 300 cycles then that oldest instruction cannot commit for a really long time, right? And that introduces stalls in the reorder buffer. Okay, so this is what leads to stalls in every single stage. Then two other important concepts are the issue width and the window size. Both of these are very important determinants of final overall performance. The issue width refers to how many instructions can be simultaneously processed in every single stage of the pipeline. Okay, so if, if issue width is four, then it means that every single cycle I can fetch four instructions into the IFQ, I can decode four instructions, I can execute four instructions on my ALUs, and I can commit four instructions every single cycle. Okay, which means that under, un, under ideal scenarios, every single cycle there are four instructions committing and leaving the pipeline. Okay, so my peak IPC in that case would be four. 
Okay, so every single cycle there are four instructions that I can graduate. But there will also be several cycles where I can find almost nothing to issue or I can maybe find, you know, one or two instructions that can leave the issue queue and, you know, maybe one or two instructions complete and hence commit later. Okay, so there are several cycles where the IPC is a lot less than four. So my average IPC is most likely to be in the neighborhood of, you know, 1 to 1 1.5, you know, much lower than the peak IPC. Okay, but if I increase my peak IPC, then it means that, you know, even though there are some periods where I make very little progress, there are other periods where I encounter parts of the program where there is where, where there's a lot of ILP, where there are many instructions that are all independent of each other. And that allows me to kind of accelerate or, or breeze through those parts of the program at high speed. And that helps me boost my overall average IPC. Okay, so that is, if I instead went with an issue width of 3, my peak IPC is going to be lower, which accordingly results in a lower average IPC of say, you know, 0.8 uh, to 1.2, and I'm just making up numbers over here. Okay, so if you increase your issue width, you're increasing your chances of uh, of executing really fast when you are in parts of the program with lots of ILP. Okay, the window size represents the number of instructions that are currently in the pipeline, right? So it essentially represents the size of the reorder buffer and to some extent the size of my issue queue as well. Okay, so if I have a really large window, it means I'm able to look, you know, far into the future and that increases my chances of finding instructions that are ready to execute in the next cycle. Okay, so a large window size means that I don't have to be limited by uh, by my immediate data dependencies. It means that I can look far into the future and that increases my probability of finding instructions that do not depend on the very next image of instructions, right? And that increases my chances of doing something useful every single cycle within my issue queue. Okay, so large window size also results in a much higher uh, average IPC. Okay, so if you make your reorder buffer size go from 40 entries to say 60 entries, there's a possibility that your average IPC might go, might go from 1.0 to say, you know, 1.2. Okay, again, I'm just making up these numbers, but these are representative ballpark numbers. The final detail that I wanted to mention over here is that, you know, because of how we've designed our out-of-order pipeline, we no longer have to worry about write after read and write after write hazards, because every instruction that enters the pipeline is assigned a unique register for its output. Okay, so my initial code may have, you know, code that looks like this where you have, you know, write after read in this case and, you know, write after write dependencies. Okay, and note that, you know, these dependencies were created in my initial code because I ran out of register names, right? I had to reuse the same name R1 multiple times and that led to these hazards. Okay, but when I go to my new code, it looks completely different because every time I write something to a register, I'm picking a new and unique register name, right? So this becomes P45 and this becomes, you know, P56. And so all these names end up being different. And so once you go to the renamed version of the code, there are no more write after read and write after write hazards. Okay, so this out of order pipeline is only limited by read after write hazards, right? The true dependencies where, you know, someone produces a result and someone later is, you know, is, is going to need to read the value of that, of that instruction. Okay, so it's only these two data dependencies which force stalls in my issue queue and, you know, that ultimately leads to the issue queue being full, that ultimately leads to my decode stage not being able to make progress and so on. Okay, so, you know, most problems in this out-of-order pipeline can be traced back to some read-after-write dependencies where it's taking a really long time to produce a result in R1, you know, maybe some fetch from memory, for example. So in the next video, I'll look at how to handle branch mispredicts and also how to do wake up at the right time and then how to integrate uh, a load store queue into my design.